party night in a college town. There's just so many people around and out at all hours. There was always something going on. At Kilroy's Bar in Bloomington, Indiana, students from Indiana University pack the place and then head home in the early morning hours. You feel very close-knit there. There was never like a question of me being unsafe. Yet it was shortly after leaving Kilroy's, five years ago this month, that 20-year-old Lauren Spear, a sophomore from New York, vanished off the streets of Bloomington and has not been seen since. I really just would like to hear this is where you can find your daughter. It's the not knowing what happened to her, where she might be, or, you know, it's, it's unbearable. But tonight, Lauren Spears' parents may be getting closer to knowing what happened. They came from up this direction. For more than a year, 2020 has been tracking a reinvigorated investigation. Surveillance cameras. With the help of former FBI cold case agent Brad Garrett, now an ABC News consultant, retracing her every step. Last seen actually at this intersection. The last time she was seen alive is exactly where we're standing. I really just would like to be able to bring Lauren home. I'm looking at Lauren Spear grew up in the New York City suburb of Scarsdale. What are you going to be? I'm going to be a princess. You're going to be a princess. She's a great kid, uh, high energy, very caring. Very caring. Loving. I love you. You love me. She really had a zest for life. <laughs> I love that. I know. That's so Lauren. Her heartbroken mother and father, Charlene and Rob Spear, that made me cry, honey. Try now to smile through their tears as they remember the good times. The child ballerina. Mom and Dad, I just want to say thank you. I'm having an amazing night, and I love you too so much. The coming of age at her bat mitzvah. We're proudest of how she handles herself her boundless potential, and her joy in living life. You are proud parents. Yeah, we're very proud. So proud. Very proud. The call that ended her parents' dreams for Lauren came on June 3rd, 2011. We were eating dinner, and Robbie, the phone rang. I went to answer the phone, and Robbie said, Char, Lauren's missing. So it's really heart-stopping, you know? Lauren Spear has become a household name. One of the highest profile missing person cases in America. We believe that the chances are very great that there was foul play because otherwise we, we feel Lauren would have made contact by now. My first thing is to say to the person that has Lauren or that has harmed Lauren, shame on you. Shame on you. You're on the search and fire. Search. Search. Okay. Hundreds of volunteers you walk up and down the streets, check dumpsters, yeah. check alleyways. Join Lauren's parents. Make sure you pay attention to the creek area while you're down there. Okay. Full of hope she would be found safe and soon. I came out today just to help look for Lauren, and it's just a lot of massive territory. They searched abandoned quarries. We're continuing the search that we started. Dense forests. So you're in this massive area and you're driving, here's another pull off, let's pull off. And then you get out of the car and then you go walking through these woods and you're calling Lauren's name and you're hoping you're gonna find her laying in the, the woods somewhere and uh, it's tough, you know. Um, Let me be firm in that we're here, still committed to finding her. It's our worst nightmare. Kardashian and Seacrest now tweeting for volunteers to join the search. A massive search and a $100,000 reward have turned up little. And then, as a last-ditch effort, police searched the landfill used by the city of Bloomington. Probably the hardest thing that, that we had to do in the searches was to go to that landfill. Yeah. Stand there, watch them. <sighs> the
the search turned up empty. I start my every day hoping that today is the day. I go to sleep every night knowing that I have failed. And then I haven't. I'm sorry. I haven't done enough. Have done but, um. After June 3rd, it really um, started to sink in that this was happening. 11 days and counting since Lauren vanished. The search for Lauren Spear now stretches into a second month. This Sunday marks the one year anniversary of the disappearance of IU student Lauren Spear. Today, the missing person posters are all but gone around the Bloomington campus, and the name Lauren Spear is a thing of the past to many. So, so when I say the name Lauren Spear, it doesn't really ring a bell. Mm -mm. There's not really much talk of it anymore, no. It's the old news. I think we should let it go and get and move on. But quietly, behind the scenes, the case is very much alive. We're getting close. I think we're going to solve this. Former FBI agent Garrett and a team of private detectives hired by Lauren's parents have now turned up new witnesses, leads, and theories. Everything leads to this house where Lauren was or is. Garrett started with those closest to Lauren and the young men she was with the night she disappeared. When something happens to someone, it's usually from their own circle. Garrett also focused on reports of a white truck in the area that night the kind of truck driven by this ex-convict. He might be somebody we need to take a look at. Regarding the disappearance of Lauren Spear, do you intend to answer all the questions truthfully? Yes. Also in the mix, a flood of tips about the alleged involvement of current and former members of Indiana biker gangs. Did you shoot her? No, I didn't shoot her. You didn't shoot her? What did you do with her? I don't even know the broad. I told you that. Bye. And then, in the last few months, Garrett received a set of brand new leads from inside a state prison, claiming that some of Lauren's fellow students saw her die and secretly disposed of her body. She OD'd. They got scared and drove her down to the Ohio River and disposed of her body. Three major theories on the board, all being chased. No lead could be ignored, no clue dismissed. So you have to figure out a way to crack that. And that's what I've been trying to do for the last year. All coming down to a fateful few moments. Basically, this mystery is in a block. Somewhere in this block. And just in this short distance from here down to there. Literally, you're only talking maybe 100 yards. It's hard not to get caught up in the energy and everything there. It really is like happy. Feel like part of the community yeah, and exactly with its Big Ten school spirit, Indiana University seems far removed from the temptations and dangers of the big city. You just felt like this is what college is supposed to be like. On move in day here every fall, the emotional scenes are played out as parents say goodbye, just as Lauren's parents, Charlene and Rob, did in 2009 confident she was in a good place. I didn't have any qualms about saying goodbye. Did you have any sense at all that there could be danger there? No. No. No, not at all. As far as Lauren's parents knew and heard from her roommates, their daughter fit right in and was busy studying for a career in the world of fashion. She's just bubbly and outgoing, and you just really instantly fall in love with her when you meet her. But what her parents only later came to learn from investigators is that Bloomington, like many college towns, has its dark side. With students describing rampant alcohol abuse and a thriving drug scene. Cocaine, Xanax, all types of different drugs, marijuana, uh, some people dipped into acid. Seth Parker, now clean, says he was part of that scene. It was just a whole bunch of college kids that had money and could afford to do the things that they were doing. Including Lauren Spear. Was it distressing to hear that there was this party scene and she was part of it? I don't think I, I don't think I realized um, what degree, you know, and it was a little bit of a shock. 
In fact, police found a small amount of cocaine in her room after she disappeared. So drugs, unfortunately, are the key component to this case. On the night she vanished, Lauren was in full party mode soon after leaving her apartment. I think she didn't make wise choices that night, but she didn't make herself disappear. She spent a lot of the evening with a student she had just met, Corey Rossman, who other students would later say described a wild night. He's like, well, me and Lauren were hanging out, just partying pre-gaming before we went to Kilroy's watching the game. They got to Kilroy's around 2 in the morning. They're only there about 30 minutes. But during that time period, she leaves her shoes and her cell phone in the bar. And I think that gives you some indication about how out of it she may be at this point. Notably not with Lauren that night was Jesse Wolf, her longtime boyfriend since high school in New York. Any rational boyfriend is going to be concerned if you're out with other boys, particularly at 2 o'clock in the morning, potentially drunk in a bar. So as, as a veteran investigator, does that raise questions of motive, possible jealousy? Of course. When she leaves here, this begins a sort of two-hour odyssey. Roughly two hours between leaving Kilroy's and when she ultimately disappears. Lauren and Corey Rossman leave Kilroy's and walk about a block away to her off-campus student apartment in the Smallwood Plaza. They're going to the her room up on the fifth floor of this building, having trouble walking, stumbling. Doors open, they step off the elevator, and there are four guys in the hallway. All fellow Indiana students. And apparently, they don't like the way Corey is handling Lauren. And Rossman supposedly says something smart to him, and this guy decks him. He goes down. So Lauren and Rossman leave quickly. It's now about 3 in the morning, and they are heading up this deserted alley towards his apartment a few blocks away. She's barefoot walking along here. She actually falls down twice in this alley, according to surveillance cameras. He eventually grabs her, throws her over his shoulder in a fireman's carry, and literally carries her the rest of the way to his apartment, which is about a block from here. She was not cared for in a way that I would want my son to care for another. And that's what kind of gets me, because the circumstances, I think, could have been a lot different had Lauren been uh, escorted back to her apartment. But instead, they end up at Rossman's place. They go in here briefly. Where his roommate later says Rossman got sick. He vomits on the steps. And went to bed. The roommate takes Lauren next door to another friend. It's about 30 feet to Jay Rosenbaum's door here on the left. Jay Rosenbaum. Jay sees what bad shape Lauren is in and says, Lauren, lay down on the couch, go to sleep, go home in the morning. And she won't do it. She says, I want to keep going. I want to go. Jay walks her to the door, and he sees her walk up 11th Street. He's the last person we are aware of that sees her alive. As police begin to suspect foul play, all three young men, the longtime boyfriend, the new friend, and the last person who saw her alive are identified by authorities as persons of interest. The three boys that she was with all hired attorneys very early on, and uh, that created a, you know, a wall of access for us. What about Lauren's boyfriend? He helped with the searches on Saturday and Sunday. But then he left. His parents came to Bloomington and took him away. What did you make of that? I, I thought it was odd. No witness reported seeing Wolf out that night. And he says he was at home watching the NBA Finals, which ended just before midnight. And then, according to his roommate, he went to bed around 2.30 AM. Wolf would not agree to be interviewed on camera by 2020, but says he has cooperated with the police and continues to deny any involvement in Lauren's disappearance. He's the most loving boyfriend you can ask for. You at the like time, Lauren's her. friend said like Jesse couldn't have like possibly you. harmed Lauren. He would never do anything to hurt her. I'm, I'm not suggesting he did anything, but I'm not comfortable that I actually know what he was doing in the early morning hours of June 3rd. Even more than Wolf, Garrett has questions for Corey Rossman. 
there's always been this sort of suspicion around Corey as to, well, did you really end up passing out and going to bed before she disappeared? I was not the last person with her. This is all I can say, I'm sorry, but I just hope that they find her as soon as possible and I'm praying for her and her family. Adding to the parents' anger, they say Rossman was the one friend who refused to talk to them or their investigators. And he claims he lost all memory of what happened after being slugged at Lauren's apartment building. That punch or punches uh, caused him uh, a temporary memory loss. Do you buy that? No, I don't. I think it's a case of self-preservation. He knows more than he's saying. I'm not sure of anything, but what I do know is that uh, there's been a complete lack of cooperation. Uh, and he was the person that spent the most time with Lauren in the last hours of her being seen. And he hasn't come forward to try to help? No. He's resisted. Corey, Brian Ross from ABC News 2020. Can we talk to you for just a second about Lauren Spear? Rossman has denied any involvement in Lauren's disappearance, but declined repeated requests to talk with 2020. Why won't you talk with uh, Lauren's parents? They just want to ask you some questions about what happened that night. Anything you can say at all? property of BC. What else is under the surface here that we don't know about? I don't know, but I'm not to the point to say he's not involved. His lawyer says Rossman continues to cooperate fully with police.